Welcome to this, the seventh lecture in the series on basic masonry construction. Uh, this is a lecture that's going to look at stonework bond patterns. And in the previous lecture, we looked at the cross section of a typical stone wall and the materials that we might use to make that wall. And we know that most historic walls of stone tended to consist of two leaves of masonry with a rubble core. And right at the end of that lecture, we mentioned that walls with different appearances could be constructed in exactly the same way by varying the outer stonework. So this lecture is going to look at some of the most common patterns of stonework that you might see on the outside of a building. But before we get down to looking at specific examples, we need to know what's meant by coursing. Coursed stone follows a horizontal level, which is related to the way the wall is built. Rows or courses can be different heights, but they're always running horizontally. So we'd refer to anything within a wall as being coursed, meaning that it has a horizontal direction. And course stones are laid in consecutive courses, with each course relying on the course below for support. Of course, if the pattern of the walling doesn't follow set horizontal courses, we can refer to this as a random pattern. Uh, and this can be used for a number of buildings and we'll see this both in terms of high quality stonework, but also more humble buildings. If the stonework follows a horizontal course, but there are occasional stones which span two or more courses, we might refer to this as broken range work or, or broken stonework. And we can see in this example, there are some larger stones which span three vertical courses or two vertical courses. And the stones that we use within construction um, have different qualities. So the quality of a stonework relates to the amount of work put into shaping the stone. The, the mason would be able to take uh, a rough stone and be able to shape it into uh, different shapes depending on how fine the building needed to be. And we would name each of these stones depending on the shape rather than the actual type of material being used. So if we take the first one, which is rubble, rubble stones are usually irregular stone shapes which have not been dressed at all. And by dressed, I mean worked with a hammer and chisel. These can be very rough quarry stones, field stones or uh, river stones, depending on where you are in the world. And they require a significant amount of mortar to put them together. We're using very rough stones, so there's a lot of space between those rough stones that needs to be taken up. And we would use smaller stones between them, which are called pinning stones. They're, they're, they're in there to pin the the larger stones together and that would make up the the overall wall. If we go up the scale in quality a little bit we get to squared rubble and this is a stone that would require the mason to do a little bit more work to take a basic rubble stone, a quarry stone, and dress it so that the corners were, were knocked off and the faces were, were brought to be uh, square. So this forms a rough block shape, but there's still going to be irregularities in it. And as with a rubble wall, we're still going to be using a significant amount of mortar, but not as much as that rubble wall. The, the gaps between the stones become more regular. Um, there are less pinning stones. They are still there to perform their function and some of them may be visible in the face of the wall, but there will be less of them uh, than with a rubble wall. The finest of all stonework is uh, ashlar. So these are stones which are finely dressed on all the faces which meet the adjacent stones. So we're building them into a wall. Each stone and its neighbour have a very square face, creating a very fine joint. And this requires significant work from the craftsman to create these tightly fitting stones. An ashlar stone usually has 
very narrow mortar joints. There are no pinnings required, so there's no gaps to fill with smaller stones. And if we look at the overall colour of the, the masonry, overall colour of the building, it's predominantly the colour of the stone rather than the mortar. So if we put those stones together and some of the options that we discussed for coursing earlier in the lecture, we can create a multitude of patterns and uh, stonework bonds. The variations of coursing patterns are pretty much endless, but most tend to fall into one of the following six patterns. So again, starting at the bottom end of quality, we get a random rubble which is a wall made of broken stones with a discontinuous course and the mortar joints are wide, very visible and there's a mix of smaller and larger stones. There probably is some coursing within a random rubble wall um, but if you were following lines at the bottom of stones or through mortar joints you would probably find that it, that it breaks quite often and there were a mix in different size and quality of stones. Stepping up the quality ladder, we get to coarsed rubble, and this is using the same rubble stones as previously, but we're trying to lay them out in a, a more regular pattern where we would use uh, a level course and have reasonably consistent mortar bed depths. Using the squared rubble that we talked about, we can lay a wall which has a number of different sizes of stones, but they're laid in regular courses with some stones that perhaps break the coursing line. There's still going to be pinning stones in there, but they may become more formalized as smaller square blocks. And one of the finest forms of stonework is coursed ashlar. So this is the very square blocks with very neat, narrow mortar joints. And these would be coarsed, so there'd be recognizable horizontal lines of mortar. Um, but those courses could be different heights, depending on what the decorative effect of the building was to be. And we can take random ashlar stones, the fine cut stones, and put them into a pattern which um, doesn't follow any recognizable coursing. And it's a very complicated pattern because it has to be uh, planned out and worked out in advance to make sure that there are stones of sufficient height um, to match the neighbours so that there are level beds and narrow joints. And similar to that, but following a rough line of a regular course, is broken rangework ashlar. So again, it has very fine lines, very fine mortar joints, but occasionally some of the courses are split, so there's two stones per course, um, or sometimes the stones span one or more courses. An important thing to think about for all of those patterns of stonework is the percentage of mortar. Um, the more dressed a stone is, the less mortar that we see on the face of the wall. And with historic buildings, uh, we tend to use lime mortar, and lime has a, a sort of yellowy honey colour. So if we see more of that mortar, then it's going to change the overall appearance of the wall. So in conclusion, stone walls can be built in a number of different coursing patterns using a number of different shapes of stones. As these stones become more regular in, in size and shape, they require more work by the mason to bring them to square. More work means more expense. Walls with irregular stonework will have a greater amount of mortar visible, and this will have an effect on the overall appearance of the wall. So aspects that you should take from this lecture are that historic walls can have different appearances depending on how fine their stonework is to appear, that walls can exhibit different coursing patterns, that rough stones need smaller pinning stones between the blocks, and the ashlar stones can have very fine mortar joints. Okay, thank you very much for listening. And as always, if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask them.